Hello, everyone. My name is Jack Hittery. I'm CEO of Sandbox AQ. Welcome to this live webinar. We'll also be recording this today. So uh, if you don't catch it here and uh, if your friends or colleagues want to see this, please send them the link. We'll be posting the link after the session and please share the link widely. Uh, we'd like to get out word about this very important topic uh, to many different communities. And uh, if you can share it and help us do that, that will be greatly appreciated. Uh, we're going to kick off uh, with some discussion among this illustrious panel. And uh, please, throughout the discussion, wait, uh, please start posting your comments in the comments area. Post your questions, comments, suggestions, links. Uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout the session. And uh, we'll be selecting a number of those questions to, for the live panel to ask. Uh, and if there's time after the panel, we'll also be reaching out to you for questions that we have not been able to get to uh, in this uh, pretty short session today. Uh, there's a lot to discuss, and it's at a very exciting moment uh, to have this discussion right now. Uh, so I would like to uh, first acknowledge and thank a number of the meetups uh, around the internet who've helped us gather such a large audience for this live event today. I'd like to thank the London uh, Quantum Computing Meetup, the Washington DC Quantum Computing Meetup, I'd like to thank the Portland Quantum Computing Meetup, and also like to thank Quantum Computing Report uh, and many others, such as Nathan Shore and others who've helped get the word out, including our own team at Sandbox AQ. Uh, with that, let me now introduce uh, the panelists, uh, and I'll ask them to each to say a few words about their background uh, and their focus in this particular area. Then I'll be uh, walking us through just a few slides just to set the stage, uh, and then I'll be turning to each of the panelists for a specific commentary on some of these important topics. So uh, let me start with Tanya. Tanya Langa has joined us. Uh, please, Tanya, if you want to introduce yourself and your affiliation and your focus in this area. Please, Tanya. Yeah. Hi, I'm a professor at Eindhoven University of Technology that's in the Netherlands. And um, I am come from the area of cryptography um, with mathematics, computer science background and have been doing post-con cryptography for quite a long time, I would say, before it was hip. Um, so I was one of those guys who've been running around in 2004, 2005, when it felt like, hey, the end is nigh, um, saying we should have to work on actively moving to post quantum cryptography and, well, have been re researching in this since then. And uh, just a note on Tanya's uh, involvement in the space with us. Uh, so we recently had a paper published in Nature. Uh, perhaps David uh, can post the link. Uh, to the Nature paper in the comment section for the audience to uh, to share in that. Uh, and then when Nature went out to find reviewers for our submission, uh, they said, who wrote the last paper in Nature on this topic? And they found Tanya Langa. So uh, it's great to have Tanya with us here and to have had her input during the review period, the peer review period of our paper in Nature. Thank you, Tanya, for joining us. Let me now turn to another uh, Luminary in the space, uh, Tahir El Gamal uh, needs really no introduction, but we'll ask him to introduce himself anyway. Uh, Tahir uh, was in the very earliest days of many of the protocols that we all use today on the internet. Tahir, please, some introduction from yourself. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Tahir El Gamal, um, I am an advisor to Sandbox AQ. My day job is a security CTO at Salesforce. And I've been a cryptographer for 41 years, uh, so it's been a while. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jack is right. I was fortunate enough to, to have landed at the beginning of the e-commerce world and, you know, built and kind of helped design the SSL protocols and, and so on. So I've seen that the e-commerce world from chapter one. Uh, it's, a, it's a hundred chapter book, by the way. We're, we're in chapter four, so, so there's a lot more to come. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's a great it's a great honor to be here. Uh, this will be a fun a fun event. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Tyre. Thank you very much. I want to introduce um, a member of our team at uh, Sandbox AQ, David Joseph. Uh, David came initially as a PhD resident uh, in the Sandbox team when we were part of Alphabet, and uh, we have the residency program, which people may know about. We are masters and PhD students from around the world. Uh, David at that time was getting his PhD at Imperial College in London, and our program is global in nature, and so spent uh, some time with us during his PhD. And then upon finishing that, uh, turned into a research scientist here uh, at Sandbox AQ. David, please, some background on yourself. Hello, everyone. 
so, so yeah, uh, I'm a research scientist here. And my background was actually uh, much more involved in quantum computing and actually, you know, quantum algorithms to try and to, to break and undermine uh, some of the really interesting computer science problems that underpin uh, lattice-based cryptography, which is one flavor of post-quantum cryptography. Uh, so that was much more like the, uh, the attacking side of things. Um, and then I came, I got involved with, with this team um, and, you know, enjoyed what, what was going on here. And we've, we've built out this quantum resistance security group. And now I focus much more on the, the sort of the constructive side of things. Uh, and I currently uh, research trying to build new new uh, quantum resistant cryptographic primitives. So uh, that's that's me. You're on mute, Jack. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you all for your introductions. Uh, I'm now just going to walk through a few slides just to set the context and stage. And again, for those just joining, please feel free to start posting comments, uh, questions, links, uh, areas that you would like the panel to address. We'll try to address as much as possible during the panel, and we will also try to reach out to you uh, and post some uh, questions uh, when we post the recording of this. Again, this is being recorded today, uh, so please do share the recording. We'll post the link to it after this. Uh, and uh, David, were you able to, yeah, here's the link to the Nature Paper. Gabriella has now uh, linked out to the Nature Paper. So as you're listening to some of the comments, please check out the Nature Paper uh, that uh, forms a context to this as well. Uh, so we talked about our speakers today and we've had introductions from them. This is the Nature Paper uh, that you now have the link to. Uh, and just to set some context, where are we in this uh, quantum, ongoing quantum revolution? Well, uh, one way to say it is that we're in the third quantum revolution. The first revolution, of course, was the foundational theoretical basis, the actual invention and development of quantum mechanics itself. And that was from the years 1900 with Max Planck's innovation and paper uh, to the Prussian Academy and then publishing of that paper. And then, of course, canonized around the year 1935. And this was really a time of great uh, upheaval in the world of physics, the years uh, 1880, 1890, uh, those decades uh, were very interesting decades when experiments uh, started pumping out data that did not cohere with the uh, physics of the time. And it became clear that uh, certain statements by certain physicists in the late 1800s that all physics was now known were a bit premature. And uh, about 30 individuals that you see uh, in a in this particular uh, photo here that was black and white, but now has been colorized with the magic of AI, uh, you know, develop quantum mechanics. And we have them to thank uh, for a lot of the uh, very interesting applications, which form the second quantum revolution, which includes the transistor developed by three physicists at Bell Labs, uh, the laser, the MRI machine, many devices we use, at least four or five dozen devices we all touch on a regular basis I have uh, quantum mechanics to thank uh, for their workings and, and their development. Uh, and that was the second revolution from about 1940s to the early 2000s. And now, as of just a few years ago, we're really squarely in the third quantum revolution, which is uh, really characterized by not only interest and development of quantum computers, but also uh, the development of, of new room temperature, small form factor, low power draw quantum sensors, uh, as opposed to the second quantum revolution of squids. Uh, we also see a great interest now uh, in quantum networking. But when it comes to quantum computers, while the initial seeds of that uh, go back to 1979 with the paper by Paul Benioff uh, and uh, then, a, then a speech by uh, Feynman, people often credit Feynman with the first mention of this, but actually uh, Benioff and Yuri Manin actually had the first two mentions of this discussion of how to really think about quantum computing. But Feynman, certainly with his fame, uh, was able to uh, amplify these ideas and set out a course that today has led us to four or five dozen different companies and academic centers now building quantum computers. There are seven major ways to physically build a quantum computer that the community has settled on. Uh, we have examples in each one of those seven modalities uh, out there today well-funded startups, academic centers, government initiatives around the world. So this is a very heady time. Uh, we're still a number of years away from a fault-tolerant quantum computer, but 
uh, progress is being made, and that really sets the context uh, for our discussion today. We have to really start thinking about securing our data now, and I'll be asking the panel about that and, uh, and to comment on store now decrypt later, a uh, particular attack uh, that is prevalent as we speak right now on this session. And this really precipitates the transition uh, from RSA and other standards that we use today to the post-quantum cryptography world or post-RSA world that we'll be discussing. Uh, and uh, the governments of the world, it's not often that we can point to multilateral, multi-governmental cooperation over a multi-year period being successful. But in this case, I think it is justified uh, to say that many governments and many standardizing bodies have now been working very closely together, particularly over the last six years since the launch of the NIST process, uh, which although NIST is a US uh, agency, it has involved a lot of connectivity around the world. I'll be asking the panel about that. And from 82 submissions for post-quantum cryptographic protocols, uh, 69 were accepted, culled down to 26, culled down then to 15. I'll be asking the panel to then break that down for us a little more. Uh, and that the reason why this is so timely to have this webinar today is that in the very near future, the next few months, we expect a NIST to start offering the specs on some of these uh, protocols uh, to start coming out. Um, and so uh, there's a lot to be done. There's a huge stack uh, to be created, developed, and deployed uh, as we move to a crypto agile world. I'll be asking the panel about crypto agility. What is crypto agility? Is it yet just another buzzword that we have to add to our jargon? Or is it real in any sense? Uh, and we'll be talking about the role of AI. Uh, why is machine learning involved now in the stack as we move for, from a generally singular standard of RSA uh, to a multi-protocol standard uh, in the future? So uh, with that, uh, let me first turn to Tahir uh, to give some general context. Um, you've seen uh, some from the earliest days, Tahir, of uh, encryption and cryptography, uh, the development, and of course, 1978, uh, you were there for that, for the rise of RSA itself, as that paper came out and that standardization process happened. It's had a good run, 40 plus years. But Tyra, maybe some opening comments from yourself uh, about this process and about the need and context for StoreNow, uh, because of StoreNow Decrypt Later, and because of the time it takes to transition. Tyra, please. Yes, thanks, Jack. So we've known since the 90s that if a large enough stable quantum computer existed, that the uh, current public key crypto systems would actually be broken. Uh, if you look at the TLS or the SSL protocol, which is used for all internet, secure internet connections today, it needs kind of four things. It needs key agreement, which is how do we agree on a single key on both sides to encrypt. It needs signatures. It needs uh, an actual uh, symmetric cipher, and it needs hashing. So the key agreement and the digital signature part of these get easily broken by a big quantum computer because the algorithms, the math in these algorithms, uh, it kind of kind of works out for a quantum computer to actually do quickly in parallel. Um, so the, 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 the store now, decrypt later, is an interesting thing. And when we say now, we actually do mean now. This is not something that somebody could do. This is something that is being done today. Um, I have actually been in certain parts of the world where people pointed at buildings that say, here is that, in, that encrypted internet data setting today. Uh, there's a lot of it. Uh, but but uh, if somebody is interested in data 10 years from now, let's just assume for the sake of argument that 10 years from now, uh, there is a big quantum computer that can break these algorithms. Uh, then 10 years from now, somebody could actually go back in time and pick up some uh transaction or some communication between two entities that they care about and they in fact could break that so this is an existing threat this is not something again that that will happen in 10 years this is actually something that we're dealing with right now so, so the reason we need new standards is we need to move the world to, to a set of of safe safer algorithms the the, the quantum computers do not affect the hashing algorithms or the uh, symmetric encryption as much. So we're actually we're actually good with these things for, for, for the time being, as far as we can tell. And so, uh, so, all right, so to, just to make sure that we in the audience all kind of make this very explicit on SNDL. So what we're what you're saying is that 
there are adversaries, be it state sponsored, be it independent adversaries, combinations of these types of adversaries out there as we speak. They're, they're infiltrating into networks. They're, they want, for example, intellectual property from pharma companies, as an example, intellectual property from chemical companies. These could be the formulas of blockbuster drugs. These could be the compounds that may become the future medicines, which again, all that data has value today, but it also still has a lot of value if decrypted by an adversary 5, 10, 15 years from now. Uh, they're exfiltrating that. It's encrypted in RSA or similar type current standards. Can't be read by the adversary today, but they're storing it to then decrypt it later. Is that a fair characterization of SNDL? So, so that, that is exactly correct, Jack. That, that is exactly what can be done. That's exactly actually what is being done. And obviously, there is a lot of data, so the entity needs to know what they're interested in. There are, there, I mean, there are information that is very valuable in 10 or 15 years. It's not, the value is, is not going to go down across the board. You know, my credit card number and yours probably don't matter as much. Uh, but, but intellectual property, government communications, you know, communication between large vendors. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of inform, healthcare uh, information. That is actually valid. Well, that's, that's an interesting point. It's it's not just governments that are being attacked. It's very much private sector and public sector. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. And, right. and industrial espionage is is a known area that you know it, it, it's a known attack vector. And that they don't need to infiltrate. By the way, it's just the one word you said. This is internet data. This is actually sitting on the public wire. So I can I can do that just as much as you can. That's a very good point. So they could, if they're in someone's network, they could, if we want, you know, siphon it off on, on Moss. But if they're just over the public wires, uh, and again, the VPN that we all use, all VPNs, the P in VPN, the private part of a virtual private network, is protected today by RSA or similar protocols, which again, to your point, Tahir, could be eavesdropped over the public internet, because that's where VPNs go, siphoned off over the wires, and then stored for later decryption. So, so yeah, I mean, to be just technically uh, crisp, TLS is actually what the internet traffic uses. VPNs have a lot of different modes, and, and let's just not get into the detail of that no. now. But the information that most people care about is actually carried over TLS, which uses either RSA or elliptic curve cryptography, both of which get broken the same way by, by a, a quantum computer. Great. And I'm going to turn to Tanya in a minute to talk about um, RSA and ECC and some other protocols. But Tara, just to finish with yourself on this initial round, um, you know, you've been in the business of enterprise, you know, scale, security and encryption standards. Talk to us about the time it takes for a bank, a pharma company, a government agency to move from one standard to another, maybe using um, uh, some of the old hash algorithms that we know to be <laughs> non-secure even nothing to do with quantum computers. Uh, it's, it's taken years, even as we knew they were not secure, for people to move away and upgrade on their hash side as well. Tyher? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the hashing does not get actually affected as much. Hashing is, is, is going to be, is going to be. Oh, yeah, no, no, I was just using that as an example of how long it takes um, for, yeah. for companies so, so, to move from one to another. Good. I have been around for a long time, and by that I actually I learned how to estimate is by asking people. So I actually ask people in large organizations, if you had to migrate all your cryptography, for some definition of all your cryptography, to post quantum, how long would it take? And it seems to be about a ten-year uh, time period, because large organizations have cryptography from places they never heard of. It, Cryptography today gets bundled with other vendor things. So, so nobody actually chooses anything. It just comes in and we inherit it. And, and there's no choice by the end customer. Uh, so, so it feels like 10 years is, is a good number for move, transitioning across all the different applications that some big organization has. Uh, obviously, the, these things get done in time. So it's not going to like nothing and then 10 years, everything is OK. It's going to happen with priority and with, with different applications and so on over time. Great. And I'm going to turn to David later in this conversation about this discovery process, the prioritization, the, the, the transition process as well. But yeah, I was just referring, for example, to MD5, which we know, of course, to be broken. And it took years, years. There's probably still some organizations out there using it now. 
but they should not be using that. Um, just as an example that of, of how long it takes sometimes for enterprises to, to migrate. Thank you, Tahir, for that initial input. Tanya, I wanna turn to you now. Uh, and uh, first of all, talk to us about the experience writing that earlier paper in Nature about this topic and some of the initial reactions you got. You've been on this case for years and years and years. Uh, what was the reaction you got from the enterprise community, from the cryptographic community, as you started really focusing on this? First, tell us about that, and then I'll go to another question for you. Well, I mean, it used to be that most people were like, yeah, okay, uh, Shaw's algorithm from the 90s, as Tarja already mentioned, 1994, it needs to be a quantum computer and people keep telling you that, oh, the biggest number that's been factored is 15. Okay, it's now up to 21. So people kind of talk down the thread. And then the next question as the thread kept growing a little bit more was like, is this going to happen before I retire or after I retire? Um, we've gotten to the point where we can convince people that no, they will have to fix this during the tenure on that job. And so there's certainly a transition over the last, I would say, 10 years, I mean, we started having conferences specific to the topic in 2006, and it was like a small audience of 40 scientists, and it grew to, we had a close registrations at 340 because it was the room size uh, in 2018. So there's it's quite a, a growth in the community. And these, these 340 people were not all scientists. It's, it's also that the industry, the banking and so on, have picked up the process and have got much more alert to it and they understand that they will have to move. And now the downside is that they can't quite move. You mentioned the NIST process and we still don't have the standards. So now we have got them uh, woken up and they now actually active and would like to move to something. And so it's actually, um, it's a very good time in this area to be active and to, to think about it because everybody's waking up to it. Um, when, so in, in my case, the Nature paper was an invited paper. So I was very pleased that Nature actually reached out and was looking for somebody to write a general audience paper because, I mean, Nature is typically not the publication outlet for mathematics and physics. Um, it's the outlet for, for physics and, sorry, for mathematics and computer science don't publish there, but say physicists and so on publish there. But they also have a pretty general audience uh, appeal and they saw the need to, to reach that audience. And so the, the uptake was very positive, um, of course, when you publish in Asia, there's a lot of PR that comes with it. So journalists pick it up. And in general, I see this more as a, as a service to the broader society to um, give a wake up call. And of course, we tried our best to, to break down the complicated mathematics into something which is sort of actionable, where people get a bit of a feeling for, yes, uh, people have thought through this, like mathematicians, cryptographers have thought through the aspects. The reader can't evaluate it, but at least you get a bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling that, yes, there is good research going in it. No, very, very helpful, Tanya, to have that perspective um, as you've been on this uh, for so long. Um, help us, Tanya, uh, let's clarify for the audience here on the session and on the recording uh, that although we talk about RSA a lot as a stand-in for all these this basket of encryption protocols that will be broken, uh, help us uh, understand the different protocols that we actually use today um, and maybe discuss uh, why RSA, why Peter Shore was able to identify uh, RSA as vulnerable in his 1994 paper in terms of um, his development of a period finding um, you know, methodology coupled with some other methodologies that allowed him to say that factoring of large numbers would actually be possible and show that to be the case in his paper. But then the realization, of course, that ECC and other protocols would also uh, fall with with uh, scaled QC. So maybe some commentary and, and perspective, Tanya, on that. Yeah, you already mentioned period. Fine, that's basically the, the background thought that people should have. So what, what Peter Shaw's algorithm is using is something like the Fourier transform. So where you're moving from the um, from different domains and suddenly, well, it's a quantum Fourier transform, so it's not the normal thing that you're used to, but it's something where, well, if you're thinking of like waves, forms and so on, it's, it's very easy to identify something that happens periodically. And what Shaw observed uh, in, his, in his first paper already is that both factoring as well as discrete logarithm can be turned into a period finding problem. So in his, his first paper is already showing that you can take like the main workhorses of public key cryptography and, and Tahir mentioned like every crypto system, every protocol on the internet is using one of those like the public key systems 
need something that is a hard mathematic problem. And the two that we're currently using are based on factoring, so RSA, and based on discrete logarithm. And that's, well, the initial Diffie Hellman, so from 1976, and then Algamal's uh, encryption system and signature, as well as the more modern version of elliptic curve cryptography. So elliptic curves didn't um, feature back then, but I mean, it's the same mathematical problem, so it just gets broken by Shaw. And it's, it's an interesting thing. You mentioned this time machine aspect before. There's always in cryptography this feeling like maybe somebody could break it. So, I mean, agencies would be well advised to store interesting traffic anyway, but it's different here. It's not the, oh, maybe somebody comes up with a smart algorithm. We already have the smart algorithm. We're just waiting for the physics to come. So it's it's different from normal. It's a certainty. The moment that the physicists and engineers are ready, it's broken. It's not just it may be broken. It's just broken. No, no, very, very, um, very, very good point. Um, and I think one that I think larger and larger audiences are beginning to appreciate. Uh, even we, when we started talking about this uh, a number of years ago, uh, more recently than than you have. Uh, we, we still face an uphill battle in explaining to folks what was happening. Now, of course, the last 18 months or so, we've seen a, a speed up and acceleration of the understanding and the knowledge. But still, there's a lot of cyber teams and others that have not fully embraced uh, what, what, is, what is happening right now, not just what is going to happen, but what is occurring right now. Um, Tanya, next question for yourself is give us some perspective um, you know, from academia and industry, the interplay of industry and academia in your mind and your experience on this topic. What is the importance of and the roles to play? There's a role to play for everyone here, but uh, how do you see this evolving? What are the what what areas would you like to see academia focus on here? Industry focus on standards bodies, governments. Talk to us about the different stakeholders here. Yeah, I would say one of the reasons that it's currently working is that there is a collaboration of efforts. So people are pulling in, they're doing things together. So if you look at the, the NIST process, you mentioned these 82 teams down to 1969, et cetera. Those are typically not individual submitters. Like if you look at the finalists at the last 15 that we have in this round three right now, these are all big groups and often a growing number of people on these teams as the uh, competition progressed because you need input from all parties. And so on the teams that I'm, so I'm, I'm one of the submitters, like I'm on, on three of the systems right now. And on our teams, we have people from different backgrounds. So we have already on the design team, we have people from industry and academia and well, counting uh, research institutions as academia here. And the industry people are not all just like the research group of companies so-and-so, but these are also people who bring in expertise of what the requirements are, what the needs are. And of course, then another step further is there's a lot of feedback that we're getting via NIST, but also directly from people who are in need of these algorithms who go like, well, it's nice and good that you're doing this research, but it doesn't fit, or it's too slow, or you don't fit in my packet size, you don't fit on my processor. And sometimes you can't really help it. It's, it's that true that some systems get larger, but in many cases, it's actually open slice research problems. And so we really need each other there. Like as an academic, I'm, I'm eager to solve your problems because, well, that's what I do in my life. I solve problems, but I need to know what problems are interesting. And so getting these, this feedback from, from industry. And then, of course, you also place users like consumers of cryptography there. So they just want to be ready to buy cryptography solutions from somewhere. But they also have requirements that for us typically come then via the intermediary industries who do um, well provide libraries or solutions to the end users. And so it's, it's really an interplay there. Um, well, my favorite topic is like doing research that matters. And so in that sense, well, give me the nice problems. Um, but I think there are plenty these days. Yeah. And then just to um, underscore one thing you said, I think it's been so critical that the NIST process has been an open process. It's been a peer uh, process with so many experts such as yourself and many others participating in this. Uh, and I think that it's fair to say the role of industry in this case is not to come up with proprietary new uh, protocols, but to respect this 
open process that has gone on, particularly the last six years, built on 20 plus years of uh, discussion, analysis, conferences, and papers, but particularly the last six years of, of review process, and to embody these protocols as they come out in industry scale, enterprise, mission critical scale, software and embodiment. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, certainly. I mean, 20 years is even underselling it. I mean, two of the candidates that I'm on are using basic ideas from the 70s. So that's like from the very beginning of public key cryptography. So MacLeese from 78 yes. and um, Lampert from 79, those are the basics of these systems. And OK, those would be out of uh, patent age by now, uh, but it's, it's very unusual for cryptographers to have patents on things. All our research is publicly available, including the software, it's open source. So if anybody wants to play with, if you want to see where that fits on your systems, uh, you can go to our web pages and, and download those web pages. So each of the submissions has their own page and you can only play with them. Like if you're running open SSH on your servers, you can um, today use uh, one of our candidates uh, and to prime, so that's there. Great, and also Tanya, I think what's interesting is that uh, throughout the culling process, you mentioned that it was very team-based and a number of teams actually were encouraged by NIST and others to come together and form a common team. Two different teams actually came together in a number of cases. So it's interesting to see the cooperation and collaboration of people sometimes who were in distinct teams sometimes coming together on the same team. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Tanya, for that input. We'll come back to you and Tyra as well. Let me turn to David Joseph now. Uh, David, you're the first author on the paper that um, uh, we all uh, participated in, uh, in Sandbox AQ, and two of our collaborators also from Google uh, as well. Uh, talk to us about what was the catalyst uh, for us as we thought about this paper. We had a number of discussions internally that I recall about the growing need for such a, a, a look at, at, at this issue, a perspective piece, a piece that would um, bring together various strands of what was going on. So David, talk about the catalyst and the need for such a paper, and then talk about what you wanted to see us all cover in the paper as you led the team. So uh, the catalyst was probably just, I identified a bit of a disconnect. So, so when I uh, came and joined the team initially, um, I was coming from a more quantum computing type background. Um, it's a slightly different skill set. And, you know, I was very familiar with, with, with PQC in the area. But then the idea of actually, um, you know, making this work, implementing uh, an enormous transition seemed like, um, you know, a really daunting task. And so what I did is I, I thought, OK, I've got this fantastic resource. I'm inside uh, Alphabet. I'm going to go and I'm going to set up a load of calls with people, find out about, you know, from these experts about what they know and, you know, can they point me to other people? And what I what became clear was that there was an enormous number of, you know, incredibly talented experts who were, you know, had incredible knowledge in a certain area. Um, and to them, everything was very obvious about their area. And then you'd speak to somebody else and they'd have a completely different take on it, a completely different area, completely different, uh, very deep knowledge skill set. Uh, but then we were also talking to, you know, prospective partners, you know, people um, externally, uh, you know, some of whom we're now partnering with now. Uh, and actually, this stuff was not obvious at all to those people. And as I was trying to kind of work out, OK, how do you take all of this information and distill it into something that is actually really quite concise, but yet comprehensive for, you know, an audience of decision makers, right? You know, people who actually have to go, okay, I've got an organization. I don't have, uh, you know, weeks or months to become an expert on this sort of niche, but increasingly less niche area of computer science so that I can make decisions. Actually, they need something which is a little bit more snappy. Uh, they need something where, okay, it doesn't go into it, all, all the detail, but it can it can act as a starting point. And then once we, you know, once once we got a bit of traction with that and we started writing it, we kind of thought, okay, well, how do we how do we reach people now? And you know, exactly as um, Tanya said earlier on, it isn't a traditional place for mathematicians and physicists and computer scientists to publish necessarily. However, what it has is this fantastic platform 
And, you know, it's about raising awareness about, uh, you know, getting all of this information out there. And then you get, you know, a certain amount of, um, it attracts a certain amount of uh, journalists who then help reach the, you know, the audience that you're trying to reach, um, you know, furthermore. And, and yeah, I guess that's the, the story of where the, where the paper came from and how we got to, to where it is now. And I think one interesting aspect of our discussion with Nature was that uh, I think the feeling we all had, David, is that we wanted a paper that was accessible. Uh, we certainly could have written a paper that was, um, it's only a very technically rigorous paper, having all the citations so on and so forth, but we wanted to uh, write it in a style that was accessible to CISOs and CTOs and C-suites. Maybe talk about that aspect of it. Yeah, 100%. So uh, in terms of making it accessible, Again, this is one of those things where, like, the more you learn about something, the more you want to, you know, really drill in and, and cover all bases. Uh, and even though we tried to make them, which was really quite concise, we still submitted it and we got told, um, you know, literally halve it, get rid of 5,000 words or something. And so we went off and we, we spent a long time doing this, but we ended up with a very lean paper where, Every word is is doing some work, and it's it, it's there because it, you know, it's useful and it means something. And we also made a, a great effort to kind of source feedback from lots of non-technical people as well. We would ask really pertinent questions like, you know, what on earth does this mean? Or you know, can can you just zoom out a bit there and explain this at a higher level? And getting so much feedback was a massive pain, but it helps produce something which is actually really. Um, accessible to um, to lots of people, and in particular, the, the decision makers who can't become experts, but have to be able to make decisions in favor of beginning to think about this transition, because that's one of the big things. That's one of the big takeaways. You don't need to be rolling out PQC right now. Uh, actually, you probably shouldn't be unless you really know what you're doing. But you do have to be thinking about this, because it is a transition, which you know what Taha was saying that um, you just ask people and they say ten years. Um, yeah, and, and, and actually that that those data points come from you know things like transitioning SHA one, which is a single hash function, and some of the people we spoke to had had nightmares about just transitioning one hash function. Well, imagine that, but all of your public key cryptography, it's it's a long journey. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, um, we're just now getting the protocols now. And so in the near term, there'll be software to actually transition to. But right now, what, what companies, enterprises, um, uh, universities, government organizations can be doing is the discovery process. Talk to us. What is the discovery process? What is this inventorying and assessment? How does that lead to a, a triaging and a transition plan? Yeah. So, um, so it's a very basic concept. You can't change your cryptography. You don't know where it is. And it, it, it sounds almost trivial and, and, and facetious, that statement. But it turns out that a lot of people have like a lot of heritage cryptography lying around, you know, maybe on some servers which couldn't be updated because of, you know, versioning issues, lots of very difficult things. But actually, there are systems out there which are running cryptography which... Uh, maybe outdated or old, and maybe the reporting mechanisms weren't so great. Because remember, the um, the RSA generation of public key cryptography was the first generation. Computing has been going since you know what, like the uh, you know forties, fifties. But actually, public key cryptography is much more recent than that, and and getting things up and running is not necessarily done in the you know in the most appropriate way in the first instance. And so now you have a lot of these different um, cryptographic providers all over the place. Maybe some people control, some organizations control their own cryptography. In some, they use third party vendors. There's this you know, crazy mix. And just identifying where that cryptography is, is the first thing you need to do. Uh, and then you need to work out, okay, well, how do we prioritize these targets? Because take this for instance, think from the point of view of an adversary. You're not just looking for the juiciest, uh, you know, pile of data that you can get your hands on. You're also thinking, what's the, you know, what are the low-hanging fruits? 
So you're trying to optimize this thing of, I want the best data that I can get at the, uh, at the, the lowest cost. And so you need to think about these things of, okay, so uh, what can we uh, migrate first? So where you can, you know, for any communication, you're going to have a sender and a receiver. If you control the, you know, if you control both the sender and the receiver, then it's more straightforward to migrate than if you're than if you depend on another party who runs the other side of the cryptography. So all of these considerations factor into how an organization needs to think about what applications to migrate first. But before they can even do that, they need to know where their cryptography is and which of their data is protected by a given algorithm. Yeah, no, agreed. By the way, if we can have folks mute, um, if you're not speaking at that moment, because we're getting a little bit of feedback, um, that'd be great. Um, so, so you know, that's, that is super helpful. In terms of, uh, there's a couple of questions in the comment box already, David, I'd like you to address in terms of when we say that a quantum computer is coming uh, that will uh, crack commercial grade slash government grade uh, RSA as an example, just talk us through that a little bit. Your PhD thesis, in fact, focuses on, you know, how quantum computers can attack various uh, protocols, not only the traditional ones, but even maybe some new ones. But talk to us just through the basics of um, a qubit and the fact that we need a fault tolerant, a set of fault tolerant qubits or error corrected qubits. Just walk us through the terminology there a little bit and mm -hmm. uh, the sense of scale that we've talked about that will be needed uh, to crack a commercial grade uh, implementation. Well, the first thing is that you're not going to get a number out of me. I'm not. I'm not going to say a number of years. A number. That's, good. That's good. That. Well, just the, the concepts yeah. of what is error corrected. What, what are we talking about here? So, to build a quantum computer that is capable of doing really interesting problems, uh, there are many, many different directions in which the hardware today has to be improved. So you have um, you have the fidelity. So how well can you uh, perform an operation on a single qubit or even a two qubit gate, which involves entanglement, um, and uh, you know, and get the right uh, state out of it? And that means basically, is it is it performing the operation you want it to do correctly? That is something which, at the moment, we're making a lot of progress in, but it's very difficult. But then you have things like, well, quantum computers have to they have to hold these quantum states or as long as it takes to process them. But actually to hold a quantum state without it collapsing and turning into something classical, you have to stop it from interacting with anything else like in the universe. That's very, very difficult. And so this is, um, you know, what you might call idling errors. Uh, and then you have, you know, error correction, because if you, if you have a probability of a, an operation going wrong, well, when you scale that up to sort of millions, billions of operations, the chance of that going wrong propagates and gets exponentially larger. There are so many different ways that uh, these systems need to be improved. More qubits, lower error rates, longer times to be able to, to hold these delicate states, that all of them need to be improved simultaneously for us to be able to do interesting operations like, uh, you know, cracking RSA. That said, this progress is happening. And actually, uh, Professor Mosca runs a study every year where he interviews a load of quantum experts and he asks them for their, uh, you know, for their weighted predictions on how long they think it will be until a quantum computer arrives. And actually, what you find is that every year that he does this, the people seem to expect the, uh, you know, Q day, call it, to come forward by more than a year. So people are becoming more and more optimistic or pessimistic, depending on what side of the argument you're on, that a quantum computer will arrive, you know, before or after, uh, well, before Tanya Langer retires, uh, which is the, uh, the benchmark that she gave. And so if you're responsible for, you know, very sensitive data, you know, maybe you're a, maybe you're a betting man, but you shouldn't be, uh, or woman, but you should not be uh, making those bets with people's very sensitive data and even if it's a 5% chance that uh, one of these uh, large fault tolerant quantum computers becomes available within that time frame, 5% chance of, of having all of your information made vulnerable is not really an acceptable risk. 
Great, great, excellent. It's very helpful. Um, I'm now going to start to address. Uh, we'll start to address now from the panel a number of the questions. A great, great questions. Keep them coming in the comments area. We're getting a lot of great stuff. I'm going to first turn to Tahir and then to Tanya. To Tahir, I'm going to ask the question, um, the two-part question. One is, uh, based on all this discussion, what do enterprise leaders need to do now? Uh, talk about, from your perspective, sitting not only at Salesforce, but also advising so many CISOs and CTOs around the world as you do. Uh, what is your conversation with them like? And then the second part to my question to you, Tahir, will be, what do engineers listening on the call today, we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of engineers alone on the call, uh, who want to get into this area, want to ramp up their knowledge in this area, what do you recommend uh, to up-and-coming engineers or even mid-career engineers who want to now re-pivot and re-skill into this area? So, And then I'll be turning to Tanya to talk about another question I see pop up. Uh, Tanya, I'll be asking you to talk about the, uh, you know, not necessarily pros and cons, but to kind of give us a discussion about uh, at a high level around lattice-based versus some of the other protocols. We see that the NIST process, as it boils its way down, uh, is, is very much uh, heavy on lattice space, but still has have others, multivariate, isogeny, code base represented in the final, final groups. So maybe just some discussion at a high level to help give some perspective to the audience on these various um, pieces. And again, uh, I'll then turn to David about what results from that, which is this crypto agility issue. Uh, and Tyra, you may also want to jump in on crypto agility as well. So Tyra, let me start with you in terms of, you know, what are you telling CISOs? What, do, what is your discussion like with them at, at large banks, large pharma companies, government agencies that you speak to, and then address the issue of engineers and others who want to now pivot or reskill into the space? Yeah, so, so we're entering a new era that actually is, is going to be very interesting. What I tell people is take this seriously, that that any organization of, of size should, should have a serious project into, and I love the transitioning word here in this nature paper, because that is actually the work. Uh, NIST and others will standardize things, so we'll have standard algorithms. We don't need to actually reinvent in, or reinvest in that. The transitioning is where engineers are going to have to do work, because we've never had to do this before. The, the, today, uh, because you get the encryption as part of vendor deliverables, the actual organizations don't even do anything. And, and you know, they don't even know whether the, the, the hardware has the cryptography or the server has the cryptography or, or both of them or w whatever actually happens inside of an organization is pretty difficult. So, so what I tell people is this does need to be taken seriously. Uh, you know, the, the FSI SAC a year ago issued a paper that says basically exactly the same thing, that, that the banking industry says we do need to transition to post-quantum cryptography, and, and they all agree. Um, it's very rare. People who know me, it's very rare for me to agree when I read a paper that I have not reviewed. I actually agreed with the Nature paper here, which is really, really rare because I have very strong opinions about this stuff. Uh, I just because I'm a cryptographer. If you don't mind, I'm just I I the, the reason the reason Shor's algorithm breaks these crypto systems is that because it computes the order of an element in a large group quickly. So so RSA and Diffie Hellman and ECC, all of these current methods use large groups and depend on the fact that you cannot compute the the order of of the element in that group quickly. And that's what actually the quantum computer, I'm, I'm trying to oversimplify, but it's kind of like that. This is a cryptographer's view, not a physics person view. Um, so so, so in, in choosing which ones to choose next, you kind of have to avoid situations like this. Uh, engineers will actually find work because we're going to have to re-architect things. We're going to have to pull the cryptography out of the systems because now they are completely hardwired and embedded into things. And we're going to have to pull this out and, and have systems that talk into cryptography services that are either side by side or sitting somewhere else, what have you, and be able to manage the cryptography in an organization as a service, basically, rather than depending on vendor A saying do this and vendor B saying do that. It actually has to be managed by the target organization itself. And, and that will actually open careers for a lot of people. So, Terry, also, I mean, from, from the cyber perspective, this is also an opportunity. This transition, yes, it's about a transition from one set of 
uh, encryption protocols to another, but it's also a chance to review and reset our cyber architecture overall, is it not? Yes, because, you know, computing has changed over the last 10 years, if anybody has not noticed. Everything is running in public cloud these days, and we're running microservices. The, the architecture of everything has changed, except for cryptography, in in sense that if I want two microservices to talk to each other, each one of them has to have a built-in SSL engine with all the cryptography inside there, which is which is kind of and, and then you, you you kind of you know the certificates wherever you get the certificates from. So so it, it is actually a, a, an interesting era that we have to modernize the use of cryptography in organizations, basically. I completely agree. Thank you, Tara, for that. Uh, since we're running short on time, I'm going to turn to Tanya now. And Tanya, maybe just a high-level short view of, uh, I know we can't compress the entire uh, six semesters of mathematics into the next two minutes, but um, at a high level, why can't, just from a simplistic point of view, just we move from RSA to XYZ? Why, why the need for multiple protocols? Give us just a raison d'etre for this, for this um, uh, multi-protocol world that we're entering into. So, I mean, like we have different protocols for different situations, and I think that is unavoidable. What is more surprising is the way that inside their work is still very dependent on the application. So it's not that you have kind of a one size fits all replacement strategy. It is more intricate and often, and funny enough, more in more recent systems and in older systems, do we make use of particular properties of a system. So like elliptic curves have been mentioned a few times and they're now uh, the internet's favorite crypto system because they're very, very small. And they also have a very nicely symmetric way of doing uh, operations. And so TLS in the last rounds have been, so TLS is what we're using for, for internet communication. If you're watching this over the internet, that is what secures this communication. And the latest version have been very much based upon this one primitive, uh, everything baked in there down to the representation of elements. And of course, our new crypto systems in post-quantum cryptography, well, new, some of them are 40 years old, but there are different systems with different hooks and places, and some don't fit in the, uh, in the frames, like in the, in the size frames and so on. And so you really have to look at what the use cases are. So that was uh, a little bit in the, the question before, which I was like, hey, I wish I got that question. Like, what can we do? So not long ago, I was co-authoring a study for INISA, so that's the European um, Security Agency, uh, about post-quantum cryptography. So if anybody wants to have kind of a, an update of that nature paper with kind of um, snippets on how cryptography works enough to survive a pub quiz or to impress at a dinner party. Um, so we wrote this, this thing also like for each of the missed finalists, there's a little blurb about it. Um, so if you want to get a quick course on that, um, go for that. And else I made a whole YouTube channel with a, a video course on, on post-quantum. So if you feel the need to actually uh, learn, the material is there. But actually, normally, we don't need our our end users to really learn what's going on. It's enough to have a bit of a feeling. And then it's the intermediate layer. So the people who are the crypto providers who really have to move. Now you ask me about like more details, or at least you announced that you would ask me about like lattices, isogenies, what have you not, all beautiful math subjects. Um, do you want to phrase the question or should I just talk on? Um, yeah, maybe just again at a high level, why the need um, to have these in particular, why is lattice space coming up uh, in so many of the protocols that have, looks like they're moving forward, lattice space seems to be um, a part of that protocol. Just talk maybe about that. Yeah. So to start from like when you're replacing what's currently there with well, factorization based and discrete log based, we have similarly uh, five ba basic math topics. But just because something says lattices, it doesn't mean it's secure. Um, it is kind of the hard mathematical problem where we know if you put it in the right way, in the right position in the crypto system, that then a quantum computer also can't break the hard problem. So lattice is one, uh, code-based cryptography is another one that's also very old and well-studied, isogeny-based cryptography, hash-based signatures, and multivariate quadratics. So those are kind of the, the five main pillars of post-quantum cryptography. And some of those are only fit for some purposes. For instance, hash-based can only be used for signatures. So it's great if you want to authenticate, but you can't use it for encryption. 
color-based cryptography is a very good, or I mean, it's, it's one of my favorites because it has a very long stability history or security history, but it's pretty much good for encryption and not so great for signatures. Lattices come up a lot because it's the closest to an all round that we have in a post quantum world. So lattices are okay for encryption, okay for signatures, have okay sizes for both ciphertext and public keys or signatures and public keys. They're never the smallest, never the nicest. If you only need one of them, you might be happy with something, but those always have trade-offs. For instance, code-based cryptography has much smaller key, um, ciphertexts, the smallest that you can get, and huge public keys. If you're in a situation that that fits, you have a scheme. If you're in a situation where you're paying for the sum of both, if you need to have both being kind of okay, you want to go for lattices as a kind of reasonable trade-off. From a security perspective, um, well, I have a hash-based submission, I have a code-based submission, I have a lattice-based submission, and it's not that I can't make up my mind. I see those three not in competition. The hash-based is for signatures, no competition there. The code-based is for long-term keys, and the lattice one is if you need to change your keys frequently, so you're also paying for the key size and not just for the ciphertexts. And so it's not just that you need one of each, but you also might want to say, okay, am I dealing with a scenario of long-term keys or short-term keys? And that's really um, something where if you're one of the intermediate crypto providers, you need to know what your customer is looking for. Do they have a scenario where they know whom they're talking to so they can kind of pre-share keys as in, in the PGP scenario, like enterprise scenarios, you know the new employee comes in and you make a public key for them, then you might want to have code based. If it's an internet scenario where you don't know who you're talking to, you want lattices. And so it's yeah, not a one size fits all. No, it's a very helpful explanation. I'm going to turn to David in a minute uh, to then introduce the concept of crypto agility, which stems from exactly the commentary you made that we do need uh, different protocols for different contexts and different situations. But just to quickly address a few of the comments um, as I, before I turn to David, uh, there was a question on my comment on room temperature. I was referring to the, in that comment to room temperature quantum sensors. Um, we, we now have, for example, uh, NV sensors in Diamond. We have OPM and others which, which, uh, which work in room temperature regimes as opposed to squids, which are super cooled. Uh, now, it also is the case, the question is asking about room temperature quantum computing. And in fact, of the seven modalities and, and different physics uh, that we can use to build a quantum computer, several of them actually do work in a room temperature regime. And so the question is asking, why not just focus on those? Why still work in a supercooled regime? And it's a very, very good question. There are pros and cons to each of the seven. And uh, it's not the topic of this session, but I'm sure our team has in store for us a new webinar that will discuss the different ways to build a quantum computer. Um, we've given many lectures on this topic and it's a fascinating topic, uh, particularly now uh, that there are, as I mentioned, four or five dozen very credible teams out there, uh, be it industry, academia, or government uh, that are now pursuing each of these seven different ways. And so it's gonna be fascinating to see that, but I was referring earlier to the other part of the quantum revolution in sensing. Uh, and I think there's also a question, did Sandbox AQ, are we involved in any of the NIST finalist teams? Uh, we as a company are not, but individual experts and scientists within our team have been part of the uh, academic uh, teams. And so Carlos Aguilar is an example, and perhaps um, David can uh, send a link to Jake and others to post uh, of Carlos's bio, but Carlos is an example of an individual uh, like Tanya, uh, who is a, a deep expert in the field and uh, has contributed to a number of the of the protocols that are out there in his capacity uh, back as professor at Toulouse University and also a researcher at CNRS. Uh, and uh, he has now joined us um, in uh, our company, but he did so prior to to joining that company. And of course, he's still part of those those teams as well. Uh, so we as a company have not uh, submitted anything as a company, but individuals. Uh, such as Carlos and others are involved in a number of these of these teams. Uh, David, let me turn to you on crypto agility. If you want to introduce that concept and how does it flow from the uh, 
kind of landscape that Tanya uh, described and the one that Tahir described as well as we transition to this new world. Yeah, so uh, crypto agility is the idea that you can build an infrastructure which will allow you to, uh, you know, make decisions about changing what types of cryptography you're using in, you know, a very fast and agile manner. And that can mean the actual algorithms you're using, so the, the, the cipher suites, or it can also mean, you know, like key length. So if you just want to upgrade security, you know, you increase the key length. Um, or, you know, one of many other different things. And the reason this is very important is, well, first of all, it's it's a security measure because from time to time there are, um, you know, sometimes minor attacks against uh, various crypto systems where you have to increase the security parameter. And other times they're pretty catastrophic breaks, right? So, for example, um, the MD5 hash uh, was broken pretty, pretty famously by flame. And when that happens, you want, as an organization, you want to be able to mitigate the threat against you once something like that becomes public as fast as possible. And being able to switch from that algorithm um, to, you know, the, the updated version or a new version is extremely important. And rewiring the entire infrastructure is something which is not something that people, you know, just kind of you know, wake up on a Monday morning and think, yeah, let's let's do that. PQC is a great motivator for that. If you have to find, rip out and replace virtually all of your public key cryptography anyway, why not do it in such a way that you build in resilient systems like crypto agility, such that when you build it this time, you'll be able to, um, you know, make these sort of programmatic changes um, when you do it this time around. And as Tanya was just saying, there's so many different flavors of uh, post-quantum cryptography, which all have, you know, very different performance profiles, then actually it, you know, maybe in some circumstances it allows you to optimize by application or maybe optimize by, um, you know, the way that your network looks, you know, network loads and uh, different times of nights, you know, different time of the night might see different bandwidth constraints. So actually, if you, uh, you know, build your infrastructure better this time using PQC as the motivating force, then actually there's a huge amount of opportunities. But it is a lot of work. And that's why in many respects, it hasn't been done yet. And just mention also briefly hybrid uh, mode where, P you know, companies, agencies, healthcare units such as hospitals uh, will be, not maybe, but will be under multiple compliance regimes at the same time, one yeah. compliance regime asking them, i.e. requiring them uh, to be under uh, traditional encryption and the other asking for uh, post-quantum cryptography. Talk to us about hybrid. Yeah, so uh, hybrid encryption is basically a, uh, a risk mitigation strategy. And the idea is that during the phase in which you're transitioning from, uh, from you know, traditional algorithms, to post quantum algorithms, for some uh, for some people who maybe don't have as much faith in the new algorithms that they might be implementing, just because they're they're slightly newer, uh, it's actually you know one thing that you can do is you can pair a traditional algorithm like RSA or ECC with a post quantum variant, and actually the security of the system is uh, lower bounded by the strongest of the two. So that means that even if there were a catastrophic break to one of these new PQC systems, actually you would still have your current level of security. And what that also means is it allows uh, organizations to maintain certain you know, certification requirements. So uh, FIPS, for example, uh, actually has a specification which allows people to, uh, to combine you know, hybrid cryptography and they say so long as the classical part sorry the traditional part is FIPS 140-2 uh, compliant I think that's the one then you're allowed to compare it with a post-quantum version and you can still keep that same certification and this is super important in enabling organizations to make that transition with a risk profile that they are comfortable with 
And then eventually in the future, you'll be able to drop that traditional part and, um, and you'll be fully in the, in, in the post-quantum era. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, we're coming to a close now. So with that, I'm just gonna ask Tahir and Tanya for any final remarks, um, thoughts for the future, recommendations, tips, uh, wisdom and sage advice as we enter this new area. Uh, Tahir first and then Tanya. Tahir. Yeah, I'm just encouraging everyone to plan a project. This is not a side job for somebody to do on a weekend. This has to be part of what an enterprise or an organization of any type uh, should plan to do to move to a, a better security level in, in the future. The hybrid thing is very important because we're all connected to each other uh, at some level, and not all the connections are going to be post-quantum secured at the same time. So every organization is going to have to run the standard current cryptography and the PQC for, 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 for at the same time for a long, long time. Digital certificates will be painful, and that's where we need, we need the industry to actually come up with uh, digital certificates that are agile, which is not something that is, is very well understood. But this is, this is a big project that has to be part of what a company signs up for at the highest level. Great. Thank you. Tanya, final remarks from yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, I would like to highlight that um, and we're presenting many things as a done deal, so and there's going to be a standardization, but it's also still an active research area. And my my recommendation is, well, definitely hybrid, use a hybrid, so use a, a pre-quantum crypto system next to a post-quantum system for many reasons for, well, building confidence, but also we have good code quality for the implementations of the pre-quantum systems. Those have been vetted over the last few years. There's even some formally verified cryptography. And post-quantum crypto is like this new large amount of uh, implementation that have been vetted less. Uh, it's important to roll it out and it's better to use some than not, but use them together. Don't put all your, all your security just on the new system. Um, we are hoping that things will get better. I mean, part of our research is still to make it nicer, faster, smaller. Um, but move now and remember how you moved and pick the most secure that you can afford. And if in some years we tell you, hey, we were too conservative, you can actually downgrade. You can have something which is cheaper, which is nicer. Um, you haven't lost your data. Whoever has stored your stuff is with a super secure system and you can benefit from something which is faster. If you move to the, well, somewhat just borderline security stuff now, I mean, none of the NIST candidates is really so borderline security, but I mean, if you're going like just a little bit in, you might still get broken. And um, so go for the best thing you can afford. Great, thank you, Tanya, so much for your comments, your participation. Tahir, thank you so much uh, for your input and wisdom in the space. Uh, and uh, as you have continued to be a leader in the space as well, uh, David, thank you for participating today and for leading the authorship of the Nature Paper and uh, for doing so much in the space as well uh, as you ramp up in your career uh, now in this area. And let me also just finish with, for those listening on this call, uh, again, who may be thinking about their, their own careers, uh, I want to encourage folks not to be intimidated. There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of maths if you want to get deeply into it and certainly coding. Uh, if you'd like to be hands-on in it. But there are wonderful online courses. What we will be doing is posting not only the recording of this session, and please do share it with your communities, inside your companies, in your academic circles and others, but we'll also be posting some helpful online courses, many of which are free uh, or certainly low cost at MIT, at many other uh, very, very good institutions who are offering these courses. I do encourage folks, even if it's not your main job, to really learn more and ramp up in the space. It will definitely benefit your career to think about the kind of cyber architectures we're gonna have going forward. This impacts each one of us, uh, be it in our jobs, or for example, just as patients in a hospital or having medical records at a clinic, how are those records uh, gonna be protected uh, when you have information at large organizations, uh, be it an online digital service, uh, a movie site, whatever it is, how is that information gonna be protected? It's good to be savvy in the space as we migrate 
uh, in, and this doesn't happen all the time. It's, it's once in many, many decades that we do a migration like this. So it pays to invest some time in understanding it. But the good news is it's the golden age of online education that we are existing in right now. And I do encourage folks to not only read some of the papers that we posted here, we'll be posting after this session, but also some of the course materials that we will point people to from some of the panelists, but also some from others as well. Thank you so much, uh, Tahir, Tanya, David. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you to the Sandbox AQ team uh, who supported this. Thank you to all the quantum computing groups around the world and the quantum computing report that did such a great job to let folks know about it and led to such a large audience today live and of hopefully even a larger audience as we now send this out over the internet, hopefully securely. Uh, see, see you all very soon. Take care. Thank you all very much.